Let's begin by uh, allowing me to um, sort of clear something up a little bit um, or emphasize something. There's a, we talked about this uh, in Jacob lecture, and then we I talked about it again uh, Friday. Um, but I want to make the point again. We have designed for this 12 months of your education the process inside of all of this, all these facts that you're learning. We've designed an educational process of the process of making a diagnosis. Now, it probably seems to most people who enter a medical education that that's the easy step. All you've got to do. All you got to do is go to school, learn all the stuff, and then when you walk in a room, you'll just make the diagnosis because you know all the stuff. And nothing could be further from, the, from that truth. Walking in the room and making the diagnosis is the hard part. Okay? That's the hard part. And so I want to, once again, walk through that process just a little bit because it pertains to what we're doing with these EKGs. So let me ask a general question. What's the most important diagnostic information you're going to get when you walk in the room? Patient history. What? History. The history. Okay, so you're going to walk in and you're going to say, what, what can I do for you today? Or, or, someone gets rolled into the emergency room, these are very different. These are very different phenomena, right? Whether you're standing in an ER or you're walking in the room. And you walk <coughs> up to the bed and say, what's going on? And they're clutching their chest and sweating and saying, my, I, my chest hurts like that. Or you might walk into a room and say, what brings you in today? And they say, I've been having chest pain. Okay. Now, an aside is this. When I trained as a, in medicine, I had a four-year internal medicine residency, and after that first year, it was our job. We didn't have, there, weren't any, there wasn't a thing called an ER doctor at that time. Uh, we took care of all the ER patients the nights we were on call, so we had to not only admit patients, take care of the inpatients, but admit, see all the ER patients too. That was back in the days when you walked uphill in the snow every day. <laughs> so, so as a second year resident, I would walk in the ER and, and the patient would be complaining the chest pain. What I figured out really fast, because for the first time in six years, I'm in the trenches with someone with a gun in a trench looking at me, and I got a gun looking at them. That's what it feels like. I, I didn't know how to interpret. I didn't know how to interpret the history of chest pain. And so the question is, do I put this patient in the hospital and work him up for a heart attack, or do I send him home? And I didn't have enough experience to know how to facilitate that history so that I would get better at deciding which ones have myocardial pain and which ones have esophageal reflux, who have uh, costochondritis, um, who have gallbladder disease. I mean, there are a hundred things that cause chest pain, and sometimes it sounds just like a heart attack. So this is a really difficult thing. Nonetheless, the way the patient describes the pain is the most important diagnostic information you're going to get. It's not the EKG, okay? But now, because you get this information, you now get to decide, what do I do next? Well, you examine them every time. So you examine them, but the exam isn't going to really make a big difference if they're having heart attack, because there aren't any physical findings, really, for heart attack. So now what are you, you going to order? 
Well, it's chest pain, so you're probably going to get a chest x-ray just because, just to make sure there isn't some infection in there or something causing this. And you're probably going to need to get an EKG. <clears throat> An EKG is not just an EKG, is not just an EKG. All right? Here's why. <clears throat> She's making room for me. She knows I'm coming. into the room in your outpatient clinic and say, what can I do for you today? And the patient says, I've been having chest pain. Do you have it right now? No. <clears throat> but I have it periodically and I've never had it before and it just started a couple of weeks ago. And so you facilitate this story and it doesn't sound exactly like a heart attack. It doesn't sound maybe, maybe doesn't sound quite as much like angina as this patient, but nonetheless, you can't, you can't afford to miss it. You really think this patient most likely has, you kind of think higher on your differential is esophageal uh, reflux with spasm. Esophageal reflux with spasm feels just like a heart attack. And you think after you take this detailed history that that's what this patient probably has, but you can't afford to miss a heart attack or angina so you get an EKG. All right? Now, you get the same test in both situations. Here, here's something you've probably never thought about before, but it becomes really important in this process of making a diagnosis. What's the pretest? Pretest is up here. What's the pretest probability that this patient's having angina? Pretest probabilities are from zero to a hundred. What? 70, 80. We don't know. We're guessing. What's the pretest probability that this patient's having an angina? 30, 40. We don't know. We're guessing. But what we do know is they're in different settings. One's having it right now. They look bad. This other one says, well, you know, they're not having it right now. and They've had it a few times in the past two weeks. It's a different situation. Okay. So, if this, this EKG could look exactly the same in both situations. Could look exactly the same. They could have flipped T waves in 2, 3, and AVF with maybe a little bit of ST segment elevation. Both situations. How would we interpret that if they had ST segment inversion and a little bit of ST, I mean T wave inversion, a little bit of ST segment elevation? What would we say about that? Ischemia. We might call it, we might call it ischemia. We might call it what? Primary T wave changes. <clears throat> now, we go from a pretest probability of 80% that EKG is positive for ischemic changes. What's the post test probability that this is angina? What? It's high. It's, it's high. Activity. How high you want it to be? <laughs> it ain't 100%. 90%. 99. <laughs> Let's go to 90. <laughs> this patient has the exact same test and it has the same result. The pre test probability was 30 to 50. It's positive for ischemic changes. What's the post test probability? 
What? 90. 90? Can't be. Now, one, one of the things we're going to learn, I'm not going to teach it this morning, but one of the things we're going to learn is that diagnostic tests, diagnostic tests, doesn't matter whether it's a serum potassium, an EKG, a chest x-ray, or the auscultation with your stethoscope. A diagnostic test always has a number associated with it that you can use to turn a pretest probability into a post-test probability. I say always, mostly. Mostly the studies have been done and you can look them up in books, you can look them up on the internet. I'm gonna teach you how to do that at a later time. We're not gonna do it this morning. But there's a number associated with it, okay? And let's just say, well, no, we're not even gonna go there. We're not gonna do the arithmetic. But if you use the same number to turn this to this, you're gonna to have to use the same number to turn this to this. So it's gonna go up. It's gonna be what? 60 to 70. 60 to 70. Now isn't this interesting? What's the whole, what's the only difference in these two cases? The history. The only difference in these two cases is the history. Which is why the history is the most important diagnostic information you're ever going to get. And the history is harder for us to teach you. It's the most difficult thing that we can teach you to do. And it's the most difficult thing we can teach you to do because it's a story the patient tells you. I mean, this might be a farmer from Cimarron County who went to eighth grade. And the words he has to describe his chest pain might just not be the same words you learned in class to describe angina, right? So you've got to adjust yourself to get this story. You've got to adjust yourself to facilitate it. Uh, be kind to him. Um, he's scared to death. It's hard. It's really hard. What happened to me as a second year resident is I sent a couple of people home with heart attacks. That's not good. It's not good. And I learned quickly this is high stakes business, and so I've got to get better. I've got to get better at taking this history. Because everything after that is less, is less important. This EKG. This EKG, when it's positive with the same findings, has the same number that it takes to turn this into this and this into this. Now, why do you think you would rather, you would rather think that the EKG is more important? Because it's not used true enough? That's true. But also there's a bias embedded. There's a bias embedded in your, in your brains. That, that you may not even know is there. But it's because of the environment in which you were born, the environment in which you've been raised, the environment in which you live. And your bias is that technology is better than interpersonal things. You have a bias toward technology. Okay? It's, it's, um, it's just there. And so you, the only way to deal with that bias is to recognize it. And you have to create a new belief system that says the history is the most important diagnostic information I'm going to get. All right. What we're doing today, what you guys have been doing the last couple of nights, is um, different than what I just described. Right? There's no patient. There's no history. All you have in front of you is an EKG, and the book I gave you <coughs> is entitled Basic but Cardiographic Interpretation. All we're doing is interpreting the EKG. So we use a little bit different vocabulary, we use a little bit different reasoning, and this is easier than it is in this situation. This is easier because we've got rules we can follow. All we've got to do now to learn the rules. Okay? So let's start with number 11. Amanda. Okay, so 
regular is kind of nice, but it's what? Sinus. A regular sinus rhythm, okay. And why did you think it was an old inferior? Because the ST segment was flat. Because the ST segment is pretty much on the baseline. There's one other finding. Uh, the T wave is upright yeah. in ABF, in, in 2 3 ABF. Correct? Either flat or upright. Okay, so let's use a little bit of it's probably true. This is probably an acute anterolateral and probably an old inferior. And let's think about that just a minute. What would be going on if someone has a, so this is a Q wave, so it's a transmural myocardial infarction. You know, you know what we mean by that? Jacob used that term the other day. Infarctions look like this. If this is the left ventricular cavity, so this is the endothelial and this is the epithelial, what we've got is, that's a transmural infarct. Okay. And a Q wave means that you don't see any electricity coming towards you through that wall of the vein. So it's all away from you. So you've got a transmural, transmural inferior infarction that happened sometime in the past. And you've now got an anterolateral infarction. And the patient's laying there talking. Well, we don't know that for a fact. We don't know that for a fact because we're not there. But we do know that they were alive when they got this EKG. What if the infarct was occurring simultaneously in the inferior wall and the anterolateral wall? What do you reckon might happen then? What? They'd still be awake. They'd be dead. <laughs> They'd probably be dead because this is the inferior wall of the, mostly the right ventricle. This is anterolateral, mostly of the Left ventricle, you got and, and septum. I mean, the whole heart's infarcted. You know, so so that would it's it's unlikely that you would have an acute one here and an acute one here at the same time, and they're still alive enough to have an infarct. So that would make you look more carefully at the STT waves in one or the other. And it looks like maybe the STT waves in the inferior legs might be off. Any other observations on this one? Yeah. Um, I got left atrial hypertrophy because of the inverted T waves in V1. Is that wrong? Because of the oh, because Sorry, of the biphasic P wave in yes. V1. Yeah. Is that right? Yes. How many points on the Estes criteria do you get for a biphasic P wave? That was atrial, though, not atrial. It is atrial, but but in the Estes criteria, you get some points. Okay. Yeah. How many points? Three. Yeah. You get three if you have, well, here's what Estes says. A biphasic P wave in lead V1 means left atrial abnormality. Right. That's, that's what a biphasic P wave. If this terminal portion is 0.04 wide and 0.04 deep, you get three points towards you get three points towards LVH because that means left atrial enlargement. Okay, electrocardiographic uh, criteria for left atrial enlargement. <coughs> this one isn't quite 
that big. It's pretty impressive in the first two beads. Not quite that big. The problem is, you don't have much else. Right. You have left axis deviation greater than 15, which gives you a point. So if you decided that this is probable LVH, you got four points, it's not wrong. May or may not be there because you've got an infarction. You've got the whole anterior lateral wall infarcted, so it's hard to tell. Okay, that's not wrong. Anything else? Yeah. Not something that I found, but I have a question about V5 and 6. They look so yeah. weird. I just want to know, is that something that should be looking normal with all the other things that are going on with all the other leads? No, V5 and 6 do look weird. And the thing that looks weird about V5 is there's just not much of an R. They're not much of a QRS. <laughs> <coughs> so V5, since there's an infarct 1 through 4, V1 through V4, and it's a Q-wave infarct. That means you've got a huge left ventricular infarct, right? And V5 sitting right next door to it. And so the electricity through V5 is probably going to look weird. And, and um, it's not likely to look pristine. That's why, five, that's why 5 and 6 look weird. You're just trying to get Q-waves there. It doesn't matter because it doesn't affect what we're reading. Anything else? Yes. I just have a general question. So on V1, 2, and 3, uh -huh. um, how the Q wave dips down, and then the S, is that the ST wave going up, or ST segment, and then the T wave after that that's inverted? Uh, yeah, probably. Because I was getting an irregular Q interval, because when I counted all that out, it was like 0.48. <coughs> I got something like 0. 0.40 or point. Yeah, I got 0. 0.40. Um, well, yeah. So what this is is the STT wave. It's the STT wave. <clears throat> First thing that happens if you tie a ligature around the rabbit's coronary artery is the T wave flips. <clears throat> this is the way I think of it. First thing that happens when you tie that ligature around the coronary is the T wave flips. If you leave that ligature on long enough, it's as if you tied a string onto this ST segment, pulled it up, and drew that picture. That's injury pattern. If there's a Q wave with it, it's an infarct. That makes sense. It's a it's a time progression. And so yeah, that's probably that's probably a T wave. The problem is that intervals, we read the intervals in the limb leads, <coughs> not in the V leads. So it's probably not quite as long as it looks like. This one's a lot longer in the V leads because you've got that end part out there. Okay. So stay with the limb leads on the intervals. 13? Yes. Did you say that we the intervals in the limb leads? The limb leads. Is that all oh, I haven't been doing it. Yeah. You've been doing it in the V leads? I just don't know where I can find them. Well, that's not, bad. that's not bad either, but the rule is to try to do them in the limb leads. The intervals in the limb Yes. 12. Did we just do 12? No. <laughs> okay, 12. All right. Okay, so he's calling it atrial fib because he can't see P waves. He's calling it uh, 
ischemia of the lateral wall, mm -hmm. is that right? Yeah. Um, and left ventricular hypertrophy or not? No. Left axis deviation. Did anyone find P waves? No. Does this look like atrial fib? No. How come? It's too regular. Yeah. Atrial fib should be irregularly irregular. So if it doesn't look like atrial fib, it might not be atrial fib. We better look harder for P waves. If uh, you can't find a P wave, is the PR interval zero, or do we not even count it? Oh, you, you can't count it. If they're in the P wave, they're in the, so it's if they're in the P wave, there's no PR interval. Okay. Okay. I think I got a PR, but I don't know if it's right. I put 0.28. That's okay. I counted an 8. I counted an 8. I said 0.28 as well. Where did you see that? Cool. Um, um, honestly, I'm not going to lie because I didn't write which lead I marked it in. It's so. in lead 3. Yeah. Okay. So look at lead 3. Can't see them. They're there, but you can't see them. Can't see them in lead 1 either. So look at lead 3. The reason I'm going to look really, really hard for P waves is that nothing else makes sense besides a sinus rhythm. It's not irregularly irregular. The QRS isn't wide. It's not slow enough to come from the AV node. It's not slow enough to come from the ventricle. This is too regular. I gotta find P waves. That's a P wave right there. There's the T wave. The P wave comes right on the heels of it. There's the T wave. There's the T wave. The P wave comes right on the heel of it. There's the T wave. The P wave is inverted and comes right on the heel of it. And the PR interval is too wide. Oh my goodness. 0.28 in lead 3. And so this is a first degree AB block. This is a first degree AB block, which explains why um, the rate is reasonable. The rate's about 100, right? Um, uh, QRS is normal, QT is normal. Um, Axis was a little bit negative, minus 20 to 30. Yeah. Now let's worry about what does uh, what does V5 look like? LV. LV. What? LVH. It looks like a LVH. There's too much R wave there. I'm going to teach you a new trick that I didn't teach you before. Um, if you add. If you add the R wave in V5, how many, how many boxes it is there, to the S wave in 2, add them together. Estes doesn't do this. Estes says you need 35 millimeters of mercury, in, or millimeters, 35 boxes, in, um, in V5. Huh? V2 or V2? V5 plus V2. The R wave in V5, S wave in V2. 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30. It's not quite 35, but it's getting a little closer. Does this just give you any points for 25 R wave and V5? Yeah, How many points? Three. 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 Oh boy, okay. So we've already got three <laughs> points. What is this pattern of this ST? Strain. Strain pattern? If the patient's not on ditch, that's strain pattern. How many points do you get? Three. Three. You've got LVH. Look at lead V1. In lead V1, can you see the P wave? Yes. Yeah, look at 0.28. It's way out there. The P wave in lead V1 is inverted. It's the biphasic or inverted P wave in V1. That's the left atrial enlargement, and you get another three points. You got nine already. Oh, my goodness. So this is left ventricular hypertrophy as determined by an electrocardiogram. Questions?
you may have said this, but every time there's an inverted P wave, does that give you points for the LVH in lead or in lead one? Lead V one? I mean, yes. No, it's lead one. We're just looking at lead one, right? What, what is the bias embedded in that question? <laughs> Do you remember the question? You may have said this before, but if every time you have a P wave inverted to B1, is that better? No. There's a huge word in there. Every time. Every time. <laughs> the bias is you guys want something to be some way every time. In medicine, nothing is like this every time. It never is. That's why this is so hard. That's not true. If they don't have a pulse, they don't breathe it, they don't have a rhythm, they're dead. Every time. They're not my chance. The baby's born, you swat them on the bottom, and they cry, they're probably alive. They're not my chance every time. Okay. Very good. That's a tricky one. Yeah. So, I originally got that it was an accelerated junctional rhythm. Yeah. So there's no P waves. Yeah. And also, since the P waves are converted, it was just one of the A's and the S. Yeah. That's wrong. Because oh, there are people. There are people. Look at these three. We just pointed them out. First three AB block. Not a, not, a, not a wrong interpretation if there are any P waves. It would have to be no tachycardia. Right. It would have to be no tachycardia because the ventricular rate is too fast for a nodal rhythm. So what she's saying is, if there weren't any P waves and it looked like this, and there's a and there's a that inverted P wave in B1, what could be happening is that the AV node could be the could be the pacemaker, <coughs> and the P wave could be retrogradely conducted it could be going back up into the atrium. There could be some there could be simultaneously at the AV node electricity going both ways. When it does that, it can sometimes write a weird looking P P wave in V1 or anywhere. Uh, but but the rate is so fast that it have to be it would have to be nodal back. But there are people. So it's not no P waves in, in lead three are clear and uh, it, it's regular, so this is a first period as well. Yeah. So um, for our LVH criteria, if the R wave and the 456 or the S wave and the uh, one through three are 25, then it counts three points. But you were saying if the R wave and the B5 plus the S wave and the B2 is equal to 35, 35, 35. then it also counts? I give it three points. Okay. So okay. I, I add one more criteria. This is the S is the NAS criteria. Okay. So that's just if, like, V5 didn't add it to 25 already. Then right. you would try it. I try to add point. it to V2. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah. I just have a question. Um, I thought I maybe saw delta waves in lead one, two, AVL, and AVF. Uh -huh. I, I don't know if that is true or not, but just looking into delta waves off of Jacob's yeah. lecture. Yeah, there aren't any delta waves okay. there, but it's a good, it's a good point. When would you look hard for delta waves? You look, okay, so let's go through, let's go through this mental exercise. We gotta, we gotta memorize some stuff. What does it mean when your PR interval is too short? Pre excitation. When do you look for delta waves? Pre excitation. That's the only time you're ever going to see them. Delta waves, by definition, are in pre excitation syndrome. Here's what's happening there. If there's a delta wave where you pointed out, it's on the back side. It's on the back side of QRS. But this is a real delta wave right here. Here's a short PR interval. This PR interval is 0.09, let's say. Or, yeah, 0.09. PR interval is too short. It's less than 0.12. That's a pre-excitation syndrome. If there's a delta wave, and the delta wave wasn't there, that PR interval would be normal. 
So the delta wave is being made by this weird conduction to the ventricle. It's not going through the AV node. It's going somewhere else. We're going to see that a little bit later. Okay. What do you have if the PR interval is too long, greater than 0.20? First degree AV block. What do you have if the PR interval is too short? I mean, these are just rules. It's there every time. Okay? 13. <laughs> Bailey. Wow, I knew you were in the call of you for some reason. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I put sinus rhythm, but then I saw that in V1 through V3 it was abnormal. So I didn't know. So what, what what defines the sinus rhythm? P wave. P wave before each QRS. Okay. Or the the or I guess it being a normal rhythm rather than irregular. So don't worry about normal. Okay. Okay. Don't don't use the term normal. Don't use the term normal on this unless you unless you can't find anything wrong with it. Then it's normal EKG. Okay. Don't use the term normal when you're doing a physical exam either. You'll hear a lot of clinicians do it. But it forces you to, de to, to describe what you hear, see, and smell. So describe what you're seeing and what you're hearing and what on the physical exam. Don't say normal cardiovascular exam. Ooh, triple F zero. <laughs> okay, keep going. Okay, and then heart rate 75, PR 0.2, QRS 0.2, QT. 0.52, um, QRS frontal axis negative 70, LED, and then I put V1 has biphasic P waves, V6 is bunny ears, V2 through V4 has PT waves, so I put left bundle branch block, um, left atrial enlargement, and then I put anterior septal ischemia question mark because I wasn't sure, and possible um, <coughs> left anterior fascicular block. Okay, so we've got left lung branch block. Do we have a first grade block? No. Yeah. There's what? Are those delta waves in the church? When do you have delta waves? When the PR is too short. Can't have them when the PR is too long. So this is a first grade block. It's a left lung branch block. I don't think it's wrong. You don't think it's what? You know? Look at these two. It's on the borderline. It's on the borderline. What did you call it, PRO? Point two. Point two? If it's point two or greater, it's first degree AV block. Look, 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 listen to me. First degree AV blocks are common. Benign, easy, don't sweat it. Okay? If you called it 0.2 or greater, it's first grade block. If you call it 0.18, I'm not going to hammer you over it. And neither is anyone else. No one else is going to argue with you about it. Don't worry about it. You've got you to sweat the heart attacks. So, so keep measuring the PR. Don't beat yourself up if you miss it by 0.01. So it is greater than or equal to 0.2? Greater than or equal to 0.20. I thought it was just Yeah, I probably told you greater than 0.20. I changed the rule this morning because I called it the first year. <laughs> <laughs> See, I don't sweat this morning. I changed the rules on the show. Okay. Okay, so here's the way the test is going to work. you got to be absolutely exact. As judged by me. <laughs> Here's the way the test works. You've got an EKG, and you've got a multiple choice question. A will say, left atrial enlargement, left ventricular hypertrophy, inferior infarction. B will say, uh, pre-excitation syndrome, anterior infarction, um, left anterior hemoglobin. You've got to pick out which of those four describes this EKG the best. So you'll never be asked, what is the PRN? You're never asked that 
in the conclusions. All I'm doing on the EKG exam is seeing if you can get the conclusions. What, what group of findings on this EKG are most likely? Okay? So you don't have to be exact. Unless it's first grade you block, then you got to be exact enough. You know. If, if, if first grade you block is one of the answers, you better go back and look really carefully at the PR loops. Next? Yeah. Is that a PVC and B1, 2, and 3? Is that a PVC and B1, 2, and 3? Yes. I know. Let's just, let's just talk. Go ahead. Process of elimination when you're doing your test. Yeah. If you're looking at that choice and you're looking specifically at this present, if it's not, then that's not the answer. Okay, so let's let's try to figure out what defines PVC, premature ventricular contraction. The term implies that the electricity is coming from the ventricle, not from the AV node, not from the sinus node. It's coming from the ventricle. So, what will the QRS look like? It'll be too wide. If the ventricular pacemaker is in the ventricle, it ha QRS has to be wide. So PVC means it's wide, and what else? Premature. It's coming too early. <clears throat> okay. Here's your PVC. Now, I probably drew that one a little wrong. Let's draw it like this. It usually looks different as this one does than the rest of the QRSs. It comes too early. And there's a compensatory cost. This is too early. This is too long. And the R to R interval is the, is the same as all the other R to R intervals. It's too wide, it's too early, and there's a compensatory cost. Patient comes in and says, I'm having palpitations. It's a really sophisticated person. This is not an eighth grade guy from Cimarron County. They use Cimarron County not because I'm biased, but because I'm from there. <laughs> and he says, you know what? I'm, I'm having these, my heart's jumping around. It's jumping around, scaring me. What do you mean it's jumping around? I just feel these, I just feel these heartbeats. Scaring me. I think my heart's going to stop or something. That's a common history for PVCs, which, when they're occasional, are, as, as Jacob told you, benign. They're, they're, they're not to be worried about or treated if they're <coughs> okay. They're not feeling this PVC. They have an irritable place in their left ventricle that fires off this thing, and then it waits to reset the usual conduction and there's enough time in this interval after the PVC, this compensatory interval, there's enough time for the left ventricle to fill up over full because there's more time for blood to fall through the mitral valve. So what they're feeling is an extra strong beat after the PVC. That's what they're feeling is the heart jumping around, not the PVC. Counterintuitive thought. What do we know about the left? What do we know about the electrical my, or the myocardium of the heart? Those cells are weird. They contract harder the more they're stretched. So if you fill the heart up more than usual, they'll contract harder than the patient might feel. Make sense? So that's PVC. Anybody, anybody don't understand why this is a left, uh, a left bundle branch block? It's a left bundle for everybody. Um, may or may not be a, 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 a first degree AV block. Um, yeah. In two three of ADF, is the P wave enlarged? Is the what enlarged? The P wave. Yeah, it's um. It's a little bit wide. Um, a wide P wave, a, a wide P wave, I don't have a number on it, 
But a P wave that looks a little bit wide or pudgy in, in lead, in lead uh, three, lead anywhere, anywhere, lead one, B1 one or, or two, three and a half, can sometimes mean right atrial abnormality. The right atrium is probably too big. The left atrium is too big. The left ventricle is too big. His heart's big. Good pickup. Anything else? That's what I was, we were discussing this one because I had a couple of students ask me last week uh, to look at this one particularly. And you actually have biphasic P waves in D1 and D2, which also tells you that you've got atrial enlargement by rule. And so again, just like he said, the atrial enlargement, we've already ruled that you've got left ventricular enlargement, so you've got atrial and ventricular, so it's both forcing the heart. Overall enlargement, cardiomegaly, so you would expect to possibly see that on the, uh, the chest x as well. So you have to put both pieces together. It's a good, it's a good term. Cardiomegaly means a big heart. It's a term used to describe the chest x -ray. Not the EKG. Not the EKG. Right. But we can see atrial enlargement, we can see ventricular enlargement on the EKG. Any other questions on 13? Can you go over that conclusion? Would I go over what? That conclusion. Who, who read this one? Would you go over the conclusions? Um, left bundle branch block, left atrial enlargement, first degree AV block, PVC. Left ventricular hypertrophy. I didn't write that, but <laughs> yeah. I have shown it. Probably does have LVH. And um, the other thing this one probably has is the QT function. What did you say the QT was? 0.52. That's yeah. really long. I wrote, I think, of, wait, was this what I was talking about? Just look at your box of my Yeah, I, sometimes I forget what I'm writing, but I put left anterior fascicular block. Yeah, we're not going to talk about fascicular blocks. Okay. Okay, so um, what do you call QT? Um, I didn't write anything. You didn't write it down? No. What did you write on QT? Uh, 0.4. 0.4, what did you write? 0.56? Uh, yeah. yeah, so so people are getting pretty lot wide ones. I got 0.44 as well, wherever I look. <laughs> We say for a man it's 0 0.40 for a woman or 0.43 for a 0.44 for a woman 0.47. This is too long. This is a long QT. The So as far as LVH when you're measuring that, this one's very obvious. See where you've got this line that comes down, and then it essentially goes over and goes back up, that's because you've run out of paper and this line didn't go all the way down. Mm -hmm. So even if you were to count these boxes, you've got to make a notice that this one actually goes further. This one here. And that's in V2, so if you add those to the R wave in V5, you got LVH. It's the same thing here. It's not as obvious. It does the same thing up there. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Good observation. Number 14. Logan. He died. Yeah. Oh, he died? Oh, no. Oh, he went to all you. <laughs> yes. Um, I didn't know how to um, describe the rhythm because I didn't see a P wave. Um, but it is regular. Um, I got a heart rate of 75, a QRS of 0.16, QT of 0.24, and a QRS frontal axis, I got normal. Um, so let's. Stop there for a second. What is striking when you look at this EKG? What's point? What jumps out of the Q, page that you never seen? Q, well, the huge Q waves. The huge what? Q waves. Yeah, so, yeah, or something, or something. 
It's weird looking because it's so narrow and so straight. Yeah. Does it look weird? Yes. Yeah. It looks weird because it is weird. And it's a artificial thing. Um, it's hard isn't just beating normally. Okay. Something artificially is caused. Yeah, I, I saw that question in the notes and I didn't tell which. So uh, the question ventricle, about the pacemaker. Right. I didn't I was like I have no, I've never yeah. seen a pacemaker rhythm right, before. Right. So this is a pacemaker rhythm, and the, and the way you know it is that those, those things at the beginning of the ventricular depolarization curve are artificial. They're just, they're just straight down. They're just straight lines everywhere. Straight line ventricular, straight line ventricular, straight line QRS, straight line QRS, straight line QRS. Make sense? The pacemaker is a wire inside the ventricle causing the ventricle to fire. The QRS are too wide. That's because it starts in the ventricle, not in the atrium. So this is a ventricular pacemaker. And the question, uh, where, which ventricle is it in, is not answerable. Oh, OK. Great. Right? You, you can't tell. I, I initially thought you could tell uh, using, using the same logic as you use for bundle branch blocks. Uh, but as it turns out, that, that, what they do is they, they, uh, they put this, they put this uh, pacemaker um, most commonly on the epicardium of the heart. So this is a lead that's placed somewhere on the outside of the heart. You can't tell usually whether it's sitting on the right ventricle or sitting on the left ventricle. Um, okay? Can't tell. So this is a ventricular pacemaker. That's all you can tell. Just so ventricular? Say, because the intervals don't, ma don't matter. Uh, you can't read ischemia. It's just the pacemaker. Is it considered normal for a person with a ventricular pacemaker? Yeah, because of the rate. The rate's 75. Okay. So you're not looking, you're, when you're looking at a pacemaker rhythm, all you're worried is, the only thing you really worry about is, uh, is the battery getting low. And that is a low, slow rate. Yeah. This axis can be so far No, no. You really can't read anything on this except ventricular pacemaker. Oh. Um, new pacemakers um, allow for you to put a magnet and the yeah. yeah, so, so the key for you is to recognize when the, when the EKG is showing you a pacemaker. Now, there are also new pacemakers where the atria and the ventricle are being based. So, you know, it's a two-chamber pacemaker. So you'll see a little spike before the P wave. You'll see a little spike before the QRS. It's a five and by uh, chamber, two chamber pacemaker. And so what Tammy is saying is that they can come in and put a magnet on the patient's chest, shut the thing off, and see what the natural rhythm is that they need to. They can also change the battery if it needs to if it's too low. All right. 16, 15, uh, 15, Olivia, she didn't go to me, did she? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, for rhythm, I put atrial flutter, possibly. Um, then for heart rate, I put 110, PR interval, 0.12, QRS, 0.16. QT 0.32, um, the axis but negative 60, so um, LAD. And then for the patterns, I put inverted T waves in four, or sorry, V1 through four, so V1, V2, V3, V4. And then um, also some T, ST elevation in V5, and then Q waves in V1 through V5. Um, so then that would be anterior septolateral infarction. And I said it was age indeterminate in V1 through V4 and then acute in V5. Okay. Other, so you had what? An infarction? Yeah. And anterior, it was an anterolateral? Anterior septolateral. Anterior yeah. septolateral. And then the age indeterminate. And in it's age indeterminate four. or acute. Either one of those yeah. would work. Everyone agree with that? Yeah. 
sinus tachycardia. I went back and forth. I was asking if you agreed with the info. Um, yes. I thought B5 was injury. It was hard to see. That's okay. That's okay. So again, if you've got an infarct B1 through B4, and B5 is sitting right next door, it's going to be it's in the ischemic zone. So don't worry about that. Let's talk about, let's back up and talk. This is an anterolateral lateral infarct. If you want to throw septum in there, it's fine. I don't say that when I read the EKG. I just say anterolateral lateral because if, if it's anterolateral, lateral, the septum's involved. So it's understood, so it doesn't matter. Um, but I'm not likely to put anterolateral lateral septal infarct on a, on a test. In fact, I will not. <laughs> if I say anterolateral, lateral, it's in the anterior leads and in at least one or two of the lateral leads, okay? Uh, let's go back to the uh, rhythm. Is there a P wave before each QRS? Yes. Are there more than one P wave between each QRS? No. What's the, what's the rate? 120. 120. 120. 125. Okay. So it's greater than 100. So it's tachycardia. Now, if we're gonna if we're gonna think that this is atrial flutter, what does it have to be a multiple of the rate? 300. 300. And 125 and 130 are not multiple. So remember what I said, you need to really worry about it if it's 150. That's a 2 to 1 block in atrial flutter. You can get a rate of 150 if in a sinus rhythm, if you're exercising really hard, or someone's infusing epinephrine into your vein, but, but it's not common. If it's 150, it's much more likely to be atrial flutter with a 2 to 1 block. But 125 and 130 are never going to be atrial flutter with a 2 to 1 block. Because they're not multiples of 300. Why do they? Why are they multiples of 300? Because 300 is the atrial rate in atrial flutter. I used to say 280 to 320, which is more accurate. But I really like the way Jacob just defaults to 300 and makes you worry about being intervals. It's much easier. That's the rule that you will use to rule that out. Look at the atrial rate, and if it is not, or I'm sorry, if the ventricular rate is not a multiple of 300, then that rules it out. Almost every time. <laughs> every time it's too big or so Okay, so this is sinus tachycardia, and this is left atrial, uh, left, uh, left, left axis deviation. Is there a bundle branch block? No. What's your QRS? D1. D1's D1, D2, D3. I think there's a bundle branch block. Right bundle branch block. And, and um, this is when, this is when my caliper really, really works well. When I, when I check the, the QRS in E2, um, you know, it's a little tiny bit bigger than three boxes. It's really 0.13. Why do I look that hard? Because when I glance at this EKG, it looks like a little branch block. No bunny ears, that's true. In a right bundle branch block, where do we see bunny ears? B1. B1. What's going on in B1 on this EKG? Yeah, a heart attack. QA. <laughs> a heart attack in the anterior wall or the anterior wall of the ventricle. Just like that. What does V1C here? Electricity going away from us. If there's an infarct in V1, V2, and V3, it's, uh, V1 is busy riding a Q wave, therefore it can't be busy riding an R wave. 
Oh, so there's some exceptions. Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly what you ought to have in V6 if you have a right bundle branch block. Which is why I said look at V1 and look at V6. Now, before you can get there, you've got to be you've got to come up with the idea that the QRS is too wide. And it's barely too wide. And the reason I looked really, really closely is because 2, 3, and ABF and V6 looked weird to me. V6 is supposed to have much more R wave than S wave. This one has a really deep S wave. It's not only deep, it's wide. Now, <clears throat> yeah, I don't know if I should confuse you with this, with this idea, but, but look at this. We, we've been talking, we've been talking boxes, we've been talking boxes, count them above and count them below, and in V6 this one would be negative down here. But the fact is that the area under the curve matters. And that that S wave in V6 is twice as wide as it should be. So if it were if the QRS was narrow it'd be twice as deep. So that big slurring, that big deep S wave like this is an important finding for a right bundle branch block. The only time you won't have rabbit ears is if the anterior wall is in box. Okay, anything else? I have a quick question. For I said that for on Lee 2 and ABF, I saw like a camel hump T wave. And is that like ischemia? Is that I put inferior ischemia? I don't I don't really know. A camel hump T wave. Where? In lead two and ABF, I can show you on mine if you don't see it. I don't think I see it. I don't know what I'm seeing. Do you see it now? Yeah, I circled it, so I pointed out too. So that's the P way. Oh, this is the P. That's P. So that's a P and that's a T. Oh, okay. And that's that's the T and that's the T. Oh. That's the P. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, okay. I also got the left the Well, the P wave is not inverted to be one. P wave is initially up. So some of them might be it might be down a little bit. It might be a little bit biphasic. But the P wave goes up first, and then maybe down a little bit. But it's mostly a normal P wave. Other questions? Sixteen. Mm -hmm. Taylor. So you're seeing uh, RSR prime <laughs> in V1? Yes. Mm -hmm. And what is your uh, QRS? Uh, 0.12. 0.12. And where did you find that? Uh, I, I tried to look at a few different ones, and that yeah. was an average I got. But How many found a wide QRS in, lead, in the limb leads? You can only count them in the limb leads, remember? I didn't know that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so, if you're counting it, <coughs> count it in V1, yeah, it's too wide. I can't find 
Mm -hmm. I can't find the QRS in the little yeah. list. It's point one two or greater. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So 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 uh, so remember remember this remember this this is really important. You do the, you do the intervals first, and you do them in the limit. When the QRS is greater than point one point one two or greater, you look for a bundle branch bond. Mm -hmm. When it's less than point one two, you don't ever look. You don't need to look for a bundle branch bond because it's in there. But I just told you the other day, several times, bunny ears and V1s most powerful finding in EKGs. Yeah. Yeah. So you want to, so you want this to be a right bundle. No. But it isn't. No. But it isn't because QRS isn't wide enough in the limit. Oh. Oh my gosh. Now look at the P wave. Look at the P wave and V1. What did you think of that? What P wave? No inversion. Inverting. It's the weirdest P wave in D1 you've ever seen up to this point. <coughs> that weird oh, like P wave in D1 that. probably explains this rabbit ears in D1. <laughs> There's something weird going on in the atrial pacemaker. And, um, what a cardiologist would call this is aberrant atrial conduction. It, it didn't come from the it didn't come from the SA nose because it, 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 this P wave is too weird looking in in V1. It's didn't come from the SA nose. At least in that B, it came from somewhere else. Uh, okay. and since the atrial conduction was aberrant. Maybe the ventricular conduction is aberrant as well, which would explain the RSR prime. The point here is, do the intervals first. And if the QRS is normal, you probably don't have a bundle branch block. So if you've done the intervals and you're under 0.12, then you see this rabbit here. Now you got to take a little extra time and try to figure out, is this a right level or not? It's a really nasty trick to throw this one in. Nonetheless, you know, <laughs> um, there are exceptions to every rule. They're just not meant to always be broken. I, I'm allowed to break them. <laughs> so that's the one that has the CKG is. Oh, what did I call this one? Uh. Tropical abnormal atrial pacemaker. Because it will be a P1. Is there an inverted P wave in B2 as well? Um, I wrote it. I wouldn't be surprised, yeah. Yeah, it's inverted there too. Mm -hmm. That pacemaker is probably somewhere up around. The, uh, right, the right atrium, so you're seeing a weird P wave in V1 and V2. So a pacemaker can look like a fast line, and it can also look like an inverted P wave. Okay, okay, so that's a great question. <coughs> Thank you. An artificial pacemaker is a wire, <coughs> to the ventricle, and it's an electrical oh, shock, right. so it looks like that. But these are physiologic abnormal pacemakers. Other questions? Q wave, I'll say Q waves are only ventricular depolarization. P waves are atrial depolarization. Q waves are the initial downward deflection of a ventric in the ventricular depolarization, which is the QRS. P waves are atrial de uh, de polarization in the atrium. I see what she's saying, though, because at first we were saying that the very first deflection off the baseline mm -hmm. that goes negative is a Q wave. But what you need to do is look for Q waves first. And if they're throughout the EKG mostly, but then the area that you're concerned with, 
mm -hmm. is down first, then that, and then it looks like a QA, QA here after call that a QA, not a deflection of the QRA. So if there were no QAs, it would make it harder, but there are QAs throughout the rest of the Yes? Question. Given what we're defining as V1, V2, the P waves and whatnot, the RSR prime, how do you differentiate like just left atrial enlargement versus oh, that oh, aberrant atrial conduction? Oh, that's a good question. Um, if you call this left atrial enlargement, it, you wouldn't be wrong. But but you but you wouldn't be as right <laughs> as if you recognized that P wave as being so weird looking, it must be coming from somewhere weird. Okay. Uh, left atrial enlargement just it just looks it just looks different. It's usually just, it's usually smooth. Okay. This one is not smooth. This one kind it's of jerky. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Good question. If you said left atrial enlargement on this, it, it wouldn't be a wrong answer. Okay. Seventeen. <laughs> Kristen? Okay, I got um, a regular sinus rhythm, heart rate of 90, PR of 0.16, um, QRS of 0.08, QT of 0.32, uh, the axis is normal out of valve, plus 70. Um, we saw that leads 2, 3, and ABS had depressed T waves, so we called it ischemia of the inferior. Called it what? Ischemia. Ischemia of the inferior yes. wall. Yes. And that's first degree. No, just kidding. Anybody get anything else? Yeah. Um, I had um, inverted T wave and two, three, ABF, and I called it age indeterminate inferior wall. Age and, deter age and determinate infarct. Mm -hmm. What is the definition for an infarct on the EKG? Do you see Q waves in 2, 3, and F? No. Oh, yeah. Maybe a tiny one in 2, but there just aren't any Q waves that are wide enough and deep enough to be an infarct. So okay. this doesn't pass over into it is, it's ischemia or its primary T wave changes in the inferior leads. Anyone else write that down? Uh, I have no. a question. Yeah. Are there biphasic P waves in B1? Yep. I put down. Because I, yes. yeah. I put left atrial enlargement. Okay, that wouldn't be wrong. Okay. There are biphasic P waves, mm -hmm. left atrial. Mm -hmm. So some people will call it left atrial abnormality or left atrial enlargement. So let me, th that would be an appropriate e EKG interpretation for the P waves in B1. Let me uh, reiterate that the EKG is not the test you would order. If you were wondering if the atrium was enlarged, you'd echo it because you can just measure it. You get dimensions. You see a picture of it. But if it's there, it's reasonable to call it. I thought left ventricular um, because of the waves in V2 and V5. But I add the, R, the S waves in V2 to the R waves in V5. You get about 28, 29, you know, quite get there. The reason that you go there is because you see that back is P wave in V1, and that makes you wonder. And that's a very reasonable question to ask. Yeah. Um, in terms of the and the primary T wave changes, is there any other more right? Or they're both right? Or there's. Okay. okay, so let's remember what we're doing. We're interpreting a flat piece of paper. And the key was flip. But we don't know anything about the patient because we're not in the room. We're sitting at a heart station somewhere, or we're sitting in a PA EKG interpretation because we don't know anything about the patient. If I said to you, this is a patient who's in my ER with chest pain and sounds angiomas, and you see this. You have this, you have this situation. Uh-oh. 
flip T waves for a positive flow. But if on the other hand, this is a patient in your office who's on hydrochlorothiazide for hypertension, and for reasons I don't know what they are, but maybe I need a car payment, and so I get an EKG. That is, what I am the benefactor of someone paying for the EKG. And this T wave is flipped. The likelihood that this is due to the hypochlorothiazide and hypokalemia is much greater than if it's. So, primary T wave changes is why. Is why a lot of cardiologists would use that term instead of ischemia. Ischemia um, is subsumed under primary STT wave changes. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you. I would I taught it to you first um, at, in the setting that I had a rabbit in the lab and I was ligaturing off a coronary artery. Now we know that's ischemia, right? This, this is uh, hard, hard to do. Okay, so not one's, it's not that one is greater than the other, but ischemia is subsumed under primary STT weight changes. Anything else on this one? 18? Oh my goodness. Does anyone want to volunteer for this one? Courage. <laughs> um, I got a sinus rhythm tachycardic rate of 105, a PR interval of 0.12, QRS of 0 0.08, QT of 0.32. Um, the axis was normal with plus 33. Um, so sinus tachycardia was the conclusion. We also found. Um, ST segments were convex in V1, 2, 3, and 4, indicating anterior septal MI acute. Anybody get anything else? <coughs> um, but there's not Q waves in V3 and V4. Yeah. So that might have helped rule out the anterior. Yeah. It would rule out anterior MI. Okay, so who was this? Who was this? Injury pattern. And so you said it's an androcephal MI mm -hmm. caused because of the ST segments. Mm -hmm. Remember now, listen carefully. Jacob would have called this an MI too. Jacob, well, he wouldn't have because he wouldn't have missed what's actually on here. But, <laughs> but he, would, he looks at those and says, Look, there's tombstone in B1, B2, and B3. This is a heart attack. Get him to the cat lab. That's what he would say. Because he's an ER kind of cardiology kind of guy. He doesn't want to miss a huge MI. Did anyone find a short PR interval on this? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yeah. There's a short PR interval. Now that's a little bit less than 0.12 in the limb mm -hmm. leads. Oh, it's really four. close. So you have to look really, really close. What does a short PR interval mean? Pre-excitation syndrome. What's the name of the most common pre-excitation syndrome? WPW, Wolf, Parkinson, White. Why is it important to pick that up? <clears throat> because people with WPW can faint and they can have sudden death. So we need to find it, we need to fix it. All right. What does what does WPW mean? Okay, look here. Here's the sinus node. Here's the AV node. Here are the bundle branch blocks, or the bundle branches, right? And in the normal heart, the electricity starts in the SA node, comes down and slowed down a little bit by the AV node, and then to the HES bundles, and the ventricles are activated simultaneously. Normal stuff. In Wolf, Parkinson, White, there's a pre-excitation. So what the term comes from the fact that the ventricles are excited a little early. There's a bypass rhythm. <clears throat> there, for some reason, there's a wire hooked up to this person's heart 
that bypasses the AV node. And it's faster, because it doesn't get slowed down by the AV node. Since it's faster, the PR is a little bit short. Okay? So look at those. We don't know where that thing is. We don't know where that by we don't know where that bypass is. It could be anywhere within 360 degrees. So it could come down and hit the ventricle from below. It could come over and hit the ventricle from the top. It could come around and hit the ventricle from the sides. We don't know where it is. <clears throat> if you were V6 and you saw it here, what would V6 look like? What would the ventricular depolarization curve look like? Yeah. Electricity's going away from it. If it was here and you were V1, what would it look like? Electricity's going away from it. So there's an exception to the Q-wave rule. If there's a pre-excitation syndrome, you can't call it an infarct. Because you don't know where you don't know how those act, how those ventricles are being activated. That's one of the exceptions to the Q-wave rule. Q-wave rule means if the QRS is greater than 0.12 seconds, there's a left ventricular infarct, transmural. Unless there's a short PR interval and it's pre-excitation. Then you can't call it because you don't know where that ventricle is being activated from. Does everyone understand how the Q-waves get formed here? Now remember this. Depolarization wave going in, repolarization wave coming out, as Jacob described it. Depolarization wave is normal, repolarization wave is normal. When the depolarization wave is abnormal, as it is here, repolarization wave is going to be abnormal. And what we're calling <clears throat> elevated convex ST segments in V1, V2, V3, and V4 are just abnormal repolarization waves from an abnormal pre-excitation center. Damn. <laughs> wow. Wow. Are you going to get a tacky heart rate normally with so that it's in the AV well, it can be all over the map. Yeah, it can be all over the map. If, um, so the reason the reason the WPW can be dangerous is that if they get into a tachycardial recurrent rhythm, a recircuit rhythm, then it can become unstable and they can have ventricular fibrillation and die. It can just be too fast. But you can have pre-excitation at any rate. Questions about pre-excitation? Questions about yes. the that? Well, I have a question about this. So how come in like V5 and V6 it does like there's two that go up and then there's two that go down, like it switches? <laughs> oh here. Yeah. That's, so, a, you know, that's a really good that's a really good pickup. Okay, look at V4. After after the transition between uh, V1 and V4, the QRS looks different can't be different, can it? Well, it can, but I mean, it's not supposed to. You're not supposed to have one QRS up like this and the other QRS definitely, what the hell? What does that mean? What does that mean? Yeah, you do. Just apply a little bit of logic after what we've been talking about. Which one of those looks the most normal? Probably the first one. Yeah, it's got a little more R and not much S. So, which one has the most abnormal repolarization curve? The second two. Well, they all do. They all do. So, what has happened in V4 is that for that brief period of time, um, <clears throat> for that brief period of time, you look at V5 and V6. Same thing's happening, isn't it? Yeah. So for that period of time, for that one beat, the patient's conduction was different than the rest of the EKG, or at least for the rest of that. That gives us support for the fact that 
for some of those beats, probably the, for, for two of them, it's coming through the AV node. For others, it's coming through here. Or for most of them, it's coming through here. And for one beat, it came through the AV node. That's how you explain it. Conduction was different. And WPW is a, is a rhythm where the patient is born with it, and they commonly bounce in and out of it. They might show up in the ER with a normal PR interval to tell, go into this. Now, I want to tell you a story because we've got a little bit of time. And, and I want to tell you the story because <clears throat> it is one of the most, one of the most remarkable stories I've, I've seen in my career. I've, 35, I've, I've been 35 years. I graduated medical school in 75 and here we are 40 years later. There was a man, okay, so in the early 80s, if you had WPW and you were fainting, and someone said, boy, you know, you're a 17 year old you're a female, you're fainting, you're an EKG, you found a short period interval, we need to try to fix that. The only, in the early 80s, the only way you could fix that was to send the patient to Duke in Durham, North Carolina. And they would confirm the diagnosis. They'd take you to the operating room, open your chest, put you on a bypass machine, and put 40 or 50 electrodes on your heart and try to figure out where that pathway was. Try to figure out where is that pathway. They could do it with all these electrodes on the heart. And then they find it, and they take a knife, and they cut it, and they hope that scarring from the cut will interrupt the pathway and now you'll go through the AV node. There's a man, his name is Sonny Jackman, who came to OU Medical Center in the mid-80s, and I don't remember where he came from. He was a cardiology fellow. He didn't, he didn't go to medical school in OU. He didn't do his residency at OU, but he was there as a cardiac fellow. And he was really interested in electrophysiology. And the reason I love this story is it was so unusual. He tells me that he was at a conference. He was hearing some stories about, about the arrhythmias WPW and a variety of things. And he was worried about having to put people, operate on them and cut their chest open. He said, God, I wonder if we could fix this some other way. And he told me that he was inspired by sitting in the bar after a lecture drinking beer and bubbles were coming up in the bottom of the beer. I'm not exactly sure how the bubbles inspired him. But he's talking to a guy who was a, an engineer. He says, you know, maybe, I wonder, what, I wonder if we could, I uh, wonder if we could take a catheter. These arrhythmias, these pathways are usually, are usually somewhere in the left atrium. And they originate there. They might go down to the right, they might go to the left, but they originate. I wonder if we can take a catheter. We can't put a catheter into the left atrium directly because that's high flow, high pressure, and blood clots, and you get strokes. We don't, we don't put catheters into the left ventricle very much. <clears throat> what if we took a catheter and put it in the right atrium? That's venous. We just stick a catheter in the right vent right atrium, and we need to look in the left atrium, why don't we just get a catheter that has a, a radio frequency tip on it and just burn a hole in the left atrial septum. Stick it in there, poke it around. Well, it not only has this little thing that can burn a hole, but it also has a two, two, two electrodes on it so we can map where that pathway is. We just stick it here and there and stick it here and there and get a map, and we find the pathway. Once we find the pathway, we burn it too. We just burn it with this electrode. <coughs> then we pull the catheter out. They're no, no worse for wear, and that hole will heat. That hole we put in the septum. What? 
What? There are atrial septal defects that people are born with. There are holes in the, in the septum of people, adults, who get strokes from them. <laughs> so he comes back to Oklahoma City. He says to the engineer, the engineer says, there isn't such a catheter. He says to the engineer, will you make me one? I don't know. I don't know. I'll try. I got my lab in my garage. I'll, 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 I'll give it a shot. He's in Northern California somewhere. <laughs> this guy comes back to Oklahoma City and the engineer makes him a catheter in less than a month. Mails it out here to him. He takes dogs to the dog lab, puts it in the vein, burns a hole in the septum, pulls it out, and watches for a while. And the fact that he healed. So the whole heel. So he does it on some dogs some more and pokes it around in the left atrium and burns holes here and there and no one dies, the dogs don't die, and he pulls them out and set them on his heels. So he says, we've got to do this on humans. I was on the IRB at the time and I, he came in and gave us this talk. I said, what? You want us to let you do this to humans? And he says, yeah. The alternative is, said, the dogs set them healed. These patients suck them to heal. They're mostly young people. They're healthy people. They'll, they'll heal. And um, the alternative is to go to Duke and let them open your chest. You have a 1% chance of dying from the anesthetic alone. I mean, come on. If, I don't, if you don't let me do this here, someone's going to go somewhere. So we gave him permission for one. He takes the young lady to the cath lab. He does that, <clears throat> he finds there's only one catheter in the world now. And he, the guy made it for him in Northern California. He's been using it on dogs. Now he's using it on this lady. <laughs> well, you know, you know, that's what autoclaves are for. <laughs> and so he sticks it over there. He finds the WPW pathway and he burns it and he pulls it out. And the lady is cured. And this was about a two hour procedure. And no chance. She's done. Her PR interval now is normal. She's now using the AV pathway. He single-handedly revolutionized the diagnosis and treatment of cardiac arrhythmias. Now today, if you are interested in cardiac arrhythmias, electrophysiology, you do a fellowship in it. You do a cardiac fellowship and then you do another fellowship in cardiac arrhythmias. I think that's what Jacob's PhD is in, is electrophysiology, but it's this is the way this is the way atrial fib, WPW, is treated all over the world. And Sonny was the best at doing it. Sometimes in the in the early nineties <coughs> in the early nineties um, Sultan of Brunei son at WPW and he flew him in, they flew him into Oklahoma City, they rented three floors of one of the downtown hotels, they came over to the hospital and put him in the hospital, they had like eight black suburbans that looked like the FBI was showing up or something. This is the damnest thing I've ever seen. They took an entire floor of the hospital and Sonny Jackman went in and found his WPW path and burned it. I tell you that story, I don't know why, I guess it's just because it's the damnedest thing I've ever heard. What hospital did you do that? What? What hospital was that done at? Uh, Presbyterian Tower, OU. Well, so, um, what happened to the engineer? He made more. Yeah, he made more catheters. He got the patent. He sold the patent for $32 million. <laughs> he came to Oklahoma City when I was dean, and he, and, and, and he got an appointment to see me, and he was funding electrophysiology research at OU, so he comes in and he says, I said, well, what can I do for you? He said, I want to, see, I want to meet Mr. Bourne. I said, really? You want to meet the president of the university? He said, yeah. I said, why? He said, because I never met a senator before. I said, okay. We'll get you in tomorrow. Now he has Alzheimer's. He's not dead, but he's not far from it. All right. <laughs> took a depressing turn. Yeah, yeah I mean.
where the mind can be so awesome, and ten years later, so sideways. Number 19. are different, latent the QRS and V6 in the right bundle and the left bundle. This one looks like, more like a right bundle. And the only reason you wouldn't have RSR prime in V1 and V2 is if you had um, Q waves. And it looks like you do. So you've got an anterior infarction that's only <coughs> the right bundle branch block. Is the PR too wide, too long? Yes. So you've got a first degree AV block. Mm -hmm. Else. Left, left axis deviation. And LDH. Probably have LDH. Yeah. Probably have LDH. <coughs> yeah. <coughs> 20. Yep. Anterior. Caitlin Shaw. <laughs> Wait, she's the other one. Um, I got sinus rhythm, um, heart rate of 60, PR of 0 0.2, QRS of 0 0.04, QT 0 0.6, um, the frontal axis is normal, and then in lead 1, V2, V3, and V4, T wave inversion, and then I have anteroceptal with a question mark. <coughs> anteroceptal what? Um, infarct. What defines an infarct on an EKG? Q waves. Q waves. See Q waves in V1, V2, V3, and V4. Okay, so what's a Q wave? Q wave is the first thing that happens in the ventricular depolarization curve is down. The reason you want to call this an infarct is because of this of these STT. Yeah, I got point three six, not point six. 
kind of a cue has to be for a key wave to be an end part, it has to be 0.04 wide and 0.04 deep. A small box wide and small box deep. When you have, so what you have here is a P wave, and everything between there and the QRS is the PR interval. Anyone else? Anyone else having difficulty with cues? Where they are, what they mean, when they happen? Where the cue okay. is. Uh, so, anything else you find on this? Okay. Anterolateral scheme. That's what I have. Sinus Brady, what's the rate? I had to tie. Yeah, I have to. I put slight. A little bit under, little bit under 60, sinus Brady. Lateral ischemia or primary T wave changes. Anything else? Yes? If you were to call it a STEMI, would it have to have a T wave? No, STEMIs don't have T waves. Okay. Before someone invented the word STEMI, we called them non-Q wave infarcts. <coughs> STEMI stands for S T elevated M I. And the reason it's named that is there's no Q wave. picture. And here's the way the conversation went. The general internist, me, wasn't saying anything. The cardiologist and the radiologist are talking. Yep, there it is. 
Here it is. It's in the LAD. Left in period. There it is. It's in the LAD. It's about 70 percent. Cardiologist, it's about 70 percent. What does he mean? He means it's 70 percent obstruction of the left anterior descending artery seen on coronary artery. Oh, well look over here. On the circumflex, there's a 40% there, there's beat, says the radiologist. Oh yeah, I didn't see that. Run that back again. So they run the film again. And almost never, <coughs> almost never did those percentages get changed standing there talking. 70% lesion LA, 40% lesion Then the cardiothoracic surgeon who does his bypass walks in. What do you got? Oh, we've got, we got some LAD and some circumflex. Let me see it. They run the thing through again. The cardiothoracic surgeon says, well, that's about a 50% lesion in the LAD. Looks like a small one, about 20% over there in the circumflex. And I'm thinking, what's going on? These are well-trained, smart people who are good observers. And they got everything, they got 20 to 40% in the circumflex, they got 50 to 70% in the LAD, and you don't even operate on the LAD until it's greater than 70, greater than 50. I mean, you don't operate on tiny lesions. Whoa, whoa, what's going on? My, per, my patients, future depends on these people and what they decide is the lesion. Wow. Hope they're good. <laughs> well, they're just who they are. They're not gods. And there's no, this is literally, is this a pretty picture or an ugly picture? Now, I wasn't the only one who, who noticed this and became a little nervous about it. Some other academics somewhere got wind of this and said, well, let's, let's put this to test. Let's get us a group of cardiologists. Let's get us a group of cardiothoracic surgeons and a group of radiologists. Maybe get 20 all together. And let's get some coronary arteriograms. And let's independently show them to them and tell them to grade the lesions. And they did. You know about the uh, statistical process whereby you take two observers and ask them what they find, and then you um, and, and then you compare the two. Um, so if if I have two PA students, student one, and, two, and I give them this. I say, here are these coronary arteriograms. You tell me, you just look at the LAD, and you tell me what the lesion is. It's either positive if it's greater than 70%, or negative if it's less than 70%. That's really all we're going to ask you to do. To try to figure out what kind of reliability there is between multiple observers. What's the likelihood that you'll guess the same, both positive or both negative, what's the probability that you'll get, get both get the same answer by chance alone? 50%. There's a 50% chance that you'll guess, you'll both guess positive or you'll both guess negative. So to try to figure out what's reliable, we have to say, what's the probability for greater than 50%? And then there's a number. There's a number for that. So it becomes clinically significant the further above 50% you get. We'll talk a little bit about this when we do some evidence-based medicine. If, if it turns out that the reliability between these two people is 90%, that's really outstanding. 72% is not bad. If it's 40%, we're in big trouble. Well, it turns out that when they did that study, um, the probability that these multiple observers were better than chance alone was about 52, 53, 54%.
They were better than chance alone. But my point is this. When clinicians are standing around in the x-ray department looking at stuff and they're talking about their findings, it's better than one person taking a glance at it, dictating the report, and sending it off to you. But nonetheless, the data tell us that the likelihood that they're all better than chance alone as they look at these things is just a little bit better than 50%. Really, really shook my, shook my branches. I mean, it, the facts about how real all this stuff is, is so shaking that if you didn't really want to do it, you'd say, I, I, I don't want any part of this. I wanted to do it so badly that I decided, well, I've got to figure it out. I've got to figure out. Uh, my responsibility is to the patient. So I, I need to be honest with them. I need to tell them what the probabilities are. And I had to start talking to my patients and probabilities, which is harder than just spouting off facts. Because most people don't like to think in probabilities. They want me to be perfect. They want me to be a demigod. They want me to tell them what's, gonna, what's the right thing to do, what's the wrong thing to do. We'll talk a little bit more about this when we get into evidence-based medicine, which will be fairly soon. Um, and it'll be stuff that you that you have to really struggle with. Uh, but it points out that this stuff isn't just right or wrong. Which is why, you know, you're going to get a lot of points for maybe this is left atrial abnormality, maybe this is left atrial enlargement. It's not a wrong reading on an EKG. It's just an observation that other people aren't making. Okay. Um, of course, today's Monday. So we'll do 10 more for Wednesday. Uh, between Wednesday and Monday, we'll do a few more than 10 because I won't be here Friday. Um, so we'll have to catch up uh, over the next uh, three weeks. No more questions? Okay. See you Wednesday. Do you still want me to do the session Friday or are you wanting to just switch them together? Do you want me to do the session Friday? Uh, that'll be up to you. And we, you and I can talk about that. Okay. Yeah. Students might like that better because it keeps them from keeps them from bunching up. Yeah. All in one. Look at you. Look at this. What? Oh yeah. So the like
Okay. Yeah, I was going to say. I really think this is hard to do. Yeah, you're saying it's very clear. Yeah, okay. it's very strange. It's weird. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm 